been a while since I could hold my head up high. It's been a while. <laughs> What's going on out there, YouTube? SEL0320. I'm back, y'all. Uh, I know I've taken, what, shoot, two week hiatus, maybe more, at least a week and a half that y'all haven't seen me actually post anything up. Um, I have been seriously, seriously <laughs> out of it. I've been tired, I've been sick, uh, I've been bedridden, I've been quarantined. I'm finally feeling a lot better. Um, still a little tired, um, but I'm doing a lot better. And uh, I was like, you know, it's time. <laughs> so, I apologies for not having anything uh, out sooner. Uh, definitely a lot's been on my mind, uh, a couple topics to think about. I wanted to go through a spoiler field, a spoiler field uh, run through of uh, the entire Amazing Spider Man. Um, I wanted to talk about all the new shows that have just been picked up uh, from the DC and the Marvel Universe. Um, I definitely wanted to talk about some uh, interesting other things as far as dissecting uh, certain other movies. Um, definitely been looking forward to maybe seeing The Neighbors. I definitely wanted to look at um, Godzilla coming up um, this Friday. So it's a lot. It's a lot and I won't be able to cover it in just this video. So I'm, what I'm going to try to do, this is what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to go through in this video, I'm going to try to run through the entire spoiler field perspective review of The Amazing Spider-Man. In the next video that I do, I'm going to go and talk about all the new shows that have been greenlit officially. And there are actually two that I'm going to be talking about. Spoiler alert, uh, Gotham and Constantine already have teaser trailers already. So that's all I can say about those. So without further ado, Let's get into this Spider-Man spoiler field review. All right, off the gate. I have to get it off my chest because it is such a sad thing. All right, Emma Stone, Andrew Garfield have on-screen, off-screen chemistry. It's, 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 it's no doubt in my head or in what my eyes have seen. Um, they are a cute couple. Um, when I saw the first Amazing Spider-Man, I thought it was like such a nice rendition. It was such a different kind of feel. Uh, than how Sam Raimi um, how he presented Mary Jane in the first three movies. Um, but this one, it's just like he, they merge together, they fit together. And then in Spider-Man 2, I mean, because of the ramifications of the first Spider-Man, um, where uh, Captain Stacy had told Peter that he doesn't need to get Gwen involved, and Peter's going through this conflict in his head, the person he loves and he needs, uh, even more so than Aunt May, uh, that he's wanting to let go of because he doesn't want her to fall victim to the same thing that Captain Stacy went through. So in the first part of the movie, you do see a uh, certain backstory about uh, Peter's parents, which I thought was actually presented very well because it leaves a lot open. A lot of people say, well, they didn't tell about this, they didn't say enough about that. And I mean, I never saw the plane actually fall and crash. I saw it uh, crumbling to the ground, but I never saw it officially crash. Um, I did see what happened to his mother, but I never saw his dad actually get killed or anything. Um, and it was a very interesting scene. It was a very heart-wrenching scene because you go through what's going on in the last moments or what you think is the last moments of Peter's parents. And they're all focused on him and he would never know it. Um, and it goes back to even when later on in the movie where Aunt May had had her own suspicions about <clears throat> Peter's parents especially Peter's dad, and she thought he was just this regular guy and find out that the FBI comes by and they call him a traitor, essentially, which is comic book, this is a textbook. Um, but if you want to go real, then if they keep it straight, then they actually are agents. And I don't know if they're going to do it that way or if they're going to present it that um, there's another story arc behind it, but there's more to Peter's parents' uh, backstory. I felt like they cut it like that, not because they just wanted to squeeze it in to finish off the story and then Peter finds out, oh, my dad's not a trailer through the video. The video in and of itself, to me, it just gave resolve 
for all the thoughts that Peter was thinking about his parents, or especially his dad that Aunt May had just said. It wasn't so much that, okay, who was my dad? Who was my mom? Um, what more is it than that? I think that they did it intentionally like that to throw everybody off. Um, but getting back to what I was saying about the story arc with um, Gwen and uh, Peter, in the beginning you got Peter like going square to square uh, with um, the Russian mafia or whatever they were. They were trying to steal some of Oscorp's um, equipment and they tried to steal it. Um, something happened and uh, Peter is on the move. He was like in rare form. I mean the CG it was sick. I mean, Sony did their thing with the 3D animation and it just looked and felt real. When he's in the air, like when you just see, you just see actual just Peter or just Spider-Man by himself, it's just amazing to see. Everything else just moves around him. It's like, it feels like, I don't know, he's the center of the tension, but then the outside, it just looks amazing. Um, but going into that, like when Peter thwarts those, those guys, um, comes back to find out that Peter is late for his own graduation that's when it goes into Gwen's speech. Um, Gwen's speech to me was the quintessential thing that kind of defined the whole last part of the movie for me. I think it was beautiful and you don't hear the whole speech you only hear a certain part of it <clears throat> because Peter is fighting and going back and forth and then Peter makes it there and you can tell they're so in love and they're such a cute couple and then Peter um, is um, brought up and said that okay well do you want to meet my mom and you want to eat out with us he really wants to but then he has such a fear he starts seeing these flashbacks of captain stacy and because he's seeing these flashbacks it's so hard for him to be around her but at the same time he can't live without her and i thought that that was it was the cornerstone of the movie uh mark Welp, he does really good jobs with um what was it 500 days of summer and He's really good at touching on the special moments of emotion when it comes to a couple. And I mean, he casted the right people for these roles. I mean, Spider-Man and <laughs> uh, an emotional kind of characters. And I mean, Emma Stone just plays it so well. And I mean, unlike uh, Kirsten Dunst's character in the Sam Raimi series, like she has a love for Peter that transcends his yearning to, and love for spider-man or yearning to help other people like she loves him more than he can really truly imagine because that's why like when she gets presented with the opportunity of leaving and going to oxford and going overseas and studying abroad like it's not because um she wants him to choose it's like he she knows that he has an obligation and a need to protect the city but he, she wants him to need her more and she wants him to be around her and she can't live without him and he she she's scared that he doesn't feel the same exact way but she knows that he does and it's just so interesting and i, I really love that part of the movie i think that for me that there was a lot of stuff cut out of the movie and i mean i did find out that there was a post credit scene um which i'm not sure if any of y'all know about it but there's a post credit scene about um harry's dad actually being alive and i mean there are if you remember um before harry went into the suit that he's in i can't remember if it was section one but there was six sections um each one of them had different things in them but there was a section three that it shows in the post credit scenes that actually has norman osborne's head and i thought it was so strange another thing me and my mom we were looking at it, happy mother's day shout out again my mom um and me and my mom, we were looking at it for the second time. We were looking, and um, when Harry goes and actually finds his dad, um, and he finds him dying, his dad's got all these claws, and he's green already, and he looks like he has already took the serum that, um, that he was already kind of presenting to him. But I thought the serum looked very strange anyway when Harry actually went and found it later on in the movie but the whole thing was that when harry went to him you could tell it was all this kind of emotional turmoil that was going on but i was like what is going on that okay harry is not sick yet right before this point 
Harry has not been identified to say he doesn't have a mark on his neck, but as soon as his dad goes and gives him the cube and touches his hand like that, that is when Harry starts presenting all these different symptoms that his dad's describing, even like the tremors. And I'm wondering, like, why did they have him quarantined off just to allow his son to go in there? If he's quarantined off like that, then to me, I feel like his dad gave him something that it made him go to this need of actually self-preservation and I can't prove it but I feel like by the end of the third one or maybe the fourth one you're gonna find out that all of this is all plotted by Norman if this is all started with Oscorp then you know that Norman has his hand in everything and I, I wouldn't put it past him to use Harry in such a way um, that he wanted to get vengeance on Peter he knew that Harry I mean, he's designed to go and try to combat things that's been pushing him away. And that's what his dad's been doing, pushing him away to private school, pushing him away as a father. And I mean, now he's presented with life and death. And he's supposedly going to give him this cue that's going to save his life. No, it's, it's more to it than that. He could have went and told him about Peter if he really wanted to. Um, so I think it's a lot that is missing from this movie. Even when I look at the trailer... <laughs> There was a point where <clears throat> Dane DeHaan's character has said, like, we literally can change the world. We literally can change anything. I think something to those lines. And that was not in the movie. And to me, that was like, maybe he was, went into either, I'm not sure if this was in Ravencroft. I'm not sure if this was in the secret section of Oscorp. But he said it. And to me, that means that there were other things that he was looking at within um, this Marvel Universe today of just, I don't know, I don't know if it was because of them having to condense all these other characters into it um, and introducing like Sinister Six and stuff like that. But to me, I would have loved a post credit scene as opposed to seeing images of like the different characters, the Sinister Six characters, like armor or costumes, because a lot of my friends didn't get that. I mean, even going through the Shazam map and looking at it, like, what is this crap? Instead, they showed X-Men. I mean, granted, yeah, okay, let's put X-Men in. That's fine. You have to, you have to deal, do that. But you could have, at the end of the movie, just like you did the first one, you could have done a post-credit scene. That, that does bother me. That's something that I do have an issue with, because if I had not known that, that would have been one thing. But looking at the trailers and knowing that there are pieces didn't cut out, and even when I looked at the first one, there was a scene where the lizard... Uh, had went and gotten vengeance and killed the guy uh, that had kind of told him, well, we're going to take your funding away. And I was, I was like, I wonder what happened to this guy. But in the special scenes, it shows. And I mean, like that could have been stayed in the movie. I'm not sure if Sony has a hand in cutting these scenes out to try to fit a certain kind of mold in a time frame of how long the movie should be or if it's Mark Webb doing it. I feel like it's not Mark Webb doing it because... If you go back and look in Tumblr, Tumblr actually presents characters like Eddie Brock and talks about them through the Daily Bugle uh, section of the Spider-Man. Um, there was on Twitter, they had talked about like the symbiote um, a little bit in like a jar containing. And I mean, that goes back to the Ultimate Series Spider-Man because it could have introduced Eddie Brock. Um, Eddie Brock's parents being partnered with Peter's parents and then that actually created the symbiote and then going from there with it. Or it could have been like another com com combated um, photographer in Eddie Brock and actually something has been created from something else. But either way, I feel like there's a lot that's been left out of the movie and that does really bother me. I, I, I didn't have a problem with the last, like I said in the, in the major review, that I had no problem with the end. The end was amazing. Everything from, if y'all don't know, if y'all haven't seen the comic books of the, the Spider-Man series or the Amazing Spider-Man, I can't remember what, what issue, but everything from uh, Emma Stone's attire, everything from the clock tower, if you look back in the Amazing Spider-Man 1, there's a point where they're swinging through that same clock tower that she died at. They go through it and there's like a slight pause. And then now full circles back here. It's all about time. And I think that's what the that's, that's why he did it that way. But even with the goblin or Harry being involved in that, this is all textbook. This is what's supposed to happen. And I, I appreciate that so much. You just don't even know. And I mean, from the point where... There's a fight scene going on in the tower and it's just so epic and so crazy. 
and then like Peter barely has her and he's holding on to her dear life and then she falls and he pushes Harry out the way and he dives down and he almost has her. You can literally see the web grasping at her and then he gets her and you brought with all this hope like man he got her. Then all of a sudden you see her neck go like whack. You can tell her neck snap and then her head hit the ground and then she bungeed up and it's just one of the saddest things I've seen because they are such good characters. I really didn't want her to die. <laughs> I, did, I don't. I don't want her character to be dead. And once my friends were like, this can't be true. Is there a way to bring her back? And I, I told them like, no, nah, that's it. That's textbook. And I mean, it's gonna prepare. It's gonna propel Peter in a whole different kind of light. Um, and I think it's gonna be awesome storytelling uh, if they do it right. Another thing was that actually um, the person that played in Divergent, I forgot her name, but she plays Mary Jane in the movie, but it got cut out because they wanted to focus more so on Gwen, uh, even though Mary Jane does live next door. And so Emma Watson's niece, it, 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 it all is full circle. Everything has been cut. I feel like there should be a director's cut of this movie where they should just go ahead and have everything that they initially were going to have and just go with the flow with it. Um, but the end, and when a lot of people would disagree with me, they don't like that the little kid came out there and he tried to help defend the city against the rhino. And I thought it was like a heartwarming scene because when he first met Peter or met Spider, I keep on saying Peter, but it shows that. For me, when I see Spider-Man, I see Peter. When I see Peter, I think Spider-Man. Um, that, that just shows the amount of depth that Andrew has devoted into the character. But anyway, there's a point where uh, midway of the scene, mo midway of the movie, uh, Andrew Garfield's character uh, uh, playing Spider-Man, he goes and he finds his little kid getting beat up and he goes and intervenes on his behalf and then he encourages him in a uh, scientific way of keeping on doing something and and then the kid later on, like he loves Spider-Man, he's dressed as Spider-Man, he puts on the mask, he goes out there to try to defend everybody and his mom tries to go and save him. Everybody tells me like, why are y'all even still standing there? Why have they not shot this thing? And why are they not? It's, it's like, this is a comic book brought to film. This is a comic book epic moment. And that's what it's really truly all about. For me, honestly, that's how I felt. And it's kind of, it kind of made me feel like teary a little bit because I was like, wow, this little kid really knows what Spider-Man really represents. And then for Peter to come up behind him and say, thanks little guy. And it was just, it was awesome going up like that. But it, I think that would have felt so much better if the post credit scene would have been there because it's just kind of like a cop out because it just ended like that. Um, but no, strong performances by Ning Dahan, strong performances by Emma Stone, strong performance by Andrew Garfield. The only thing that I've heard from everybody is that um, <clears throat> Jamie Foxx's character in the beginning, they didn't like him. He's a geek and he's over over the top geeky but if you know Jamie that's kind of how you can be sometimes and like I guess that more people wanted to have more investment time in uh, Max Dillon and I mean when he first meets Spider-Man Spider-Man saves him and tells him like he's his eyes and ears and that <clears throat> he really needs him and that everything he represents like good job and Max becomes obsessed with Spider-Man like he starts talking to himself like Spider-Man is right there and it's, it's just, it really is very strange but when you're brought through to me when you're brought through isolation and self-esteem issues and abandonment issues and you also got another thing where people have been taking the things that you've worked on and devoted for the rest of your life and they're just pushing you down like you're gonna gravitate towards the one person or the people in your life that have really helped you the most and he became it became an obsession to him uh, so I've seen that uh, and so it, it made sense that when you see um, Electro walking through the streets after he's been, uh, and another thing about that, when when I saw um, Max Dillon going to the office and everybody was supposedly leaving, and you see Alex the Smythe telling him, "Oh, well, you're the big man on campus. This is your day," or something like that. I feel like all of this is designed by Osborne. I mean. I, either one, if it's not, then they did a good job of throwing me off. But I feel like 
Osborne, literally, I'm talking about Norman Osborne, even though he's supposed to be dead, I feel like he is set up that his people that help run the company don't know, or they're keeping it on a shirt wrap, um, and they, he's presenting the different experiments, such as the Lizard and now Electro. I think that Electro was the main villain centrally in the story, because Harry is just brought up through through circumstance. Harry's going to be back later, and I think that Electro will too, even if you look at the end, after he's blown up, like you see part of him still there. Um, but my thing was that when Max went in and um, they were telling him, well, uh, he was saying, well, there's an electrical wire that's like disconnected, like you need to go and do something about this. And the guy just says he's gone. Like you don't do that with a million dollar corporation. Like there's, there's, there's no reason why they would do that. With all the different experiments they have in there, they're just gonna supposedly be gone. Um, I feel like it's all setting up for something big that Norman has all plotted and planned. And I think that if if they do it like the Spectacular Spider-Man, and I did buy that over the weekend or the week, uh, whereas like Peter needed the actual symbiote suit to actually really go and defend off all six of them, I feel like that would make a lot more sense because then um, it would make it be like full circle where, okay, this is what is being held back so much and then this is how Norman Osborn is tied to it and this is how Harry was used. Um, but I can't prove any of that. This is all off of my suspicion. But I can see why everybody's saying like this is an undeveloped character because you don't know like how did he get put in this situation and how he go to just so quick having all this anger and stuff like that. Um, but I thought that Jamie did an amazing job. I really did. I really did think he did an amazing job. But it was so sad, man, when Emma died. Um, <laughs> and then when you had the speech, because uh, there was a scene where after um, Gwen had died, you got like six month time frame that they showed in like maybe about five or ten seconds. Where it goes from season to season to season. You see Andrew Garfield out there and I thought that was such an abusive scene. Um, but it was really hard to watch. It, it really was really hard to watch, but it, it was a needed thing. And another thing was, uh, which I'll touch on last, and um, I guess it's the best fit for today because it's Mother's Day. Uh, the relationship between Sally Fields, um, Aunt May, and Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker, because with their relationship, even in the beginning, like I feel like after the Amazing Spider-Man, she has an idea that her nephew is Spider-Man, but she's not gonna pressure him, she's not gonna push him, but I feel like she knows, I really do. I really feel like that in my bones. Um, but with what he's dealing with in this movie, and the inner turmoil he's dealing with, and the conflictions of what to do, and the fact that she's dealing with bills, and she's dealing with missing her husband, and then she doesn't know if Pete's gonna come back alive or dead, and I mean, it's just a lot on her. And she didn't want to present anything more to uh, burden him or hurt him by talking about his parents. And there was such an emotional scene where she's like, you're my son, you're my son. Um, I felt like that was one of the most heartfelt uh, scenes that I've seen in a Marvel movie in a minute. Um, it was just, it was just a really good scene. And I mean, even by the end of it, like she was uh, going and uh, taking and packing up uh, Uncle Ben's old stuff. And, um, like she wasn't throwing him away, she was putting him in the place that they needed to be. And he was, she was encouraging him to do the exact same thing. She knew what kind of pain this boy was in. Um, but she knows exactly what to say. She is his mother figure. And it's just, it's just awesome to watch. Now, I, I thought it was weird that Peter has been so focused on trying to find like what's going on with his parents that I rarely hear him think about or say that he's thinking about his uncle which is different from um, the Sam Raimi series, which I thought that was lacking in this one. In the second one, they really didn't talk about how much Peter really was um, missing his uncle or even told about him, or even there was a flashback of him. So I thought that was really strange. Um, but all in all, I mean, I, there's a lot of other things I could kind of talk about and dissect as far as the pacing of how they did it. But the reason why I feel they did it that way is because they brought it from a combo form to a film form. And I mean, yes, like you could choose to say, uh, well, make Max Dillon's character more grounded in the sense of more realistic, but that's not comic book related. You could maybe go and say, well, 
They didn't have to talk about Harry. They could have left Harry for the next movie. Um, I felt like he was needed in this. I thought that he brought a whole other essence to this story. Um, maybe you could say that Mary Jane should have been involved in it. You maybe you could say that the post credit scene should have been involved. I'm agreeance with you. So there's a lot of other things that I feel like they could have capitalized with this one. Going back and looking at it the second time, but I did enjoy it more the second time than I did the first time. So that does say something. That shows that they put a lot of heart into the film, but I worry that people like AVR Red and um, people like Sony uh, Pictures that they're trying to do it a certain kind of way and it might take away from the craft by the time we get to the fourth act because if they don't do it right, if they don't have like characters like Eddie Brock or Jonah Jameson and they don't cast these characters right, if they don't go and treat them with respect that they need to be treated and versus like focusing on uh, okay, marginal price with this character as in toys or video game, like it's all gonna fall face down. And for the fact that AVR it is said that that they're not going to involve characters like Miles Morales or maybe even have them in the um, Marvel Universe coming from where they are with Sony and cross they say, well, until we run out of stories, we're not going to go and do that. There's no need for that. And then with the Miles Morales, they said, no, that's never going to happen. I mean, that's just so one tracked. And I mean, in this kind of, if you really are making money, you really want to make money, eventually Spider-Man is going to have to interact with characters that are not villains. <laughs> He's going to have to interact with people that can help him, such as Daredevil. It doesn't even have to be somebody really big. It could be even like the Fantastic Four. Like these characters are a part of this mythology, are a part of this universe. And when you try to like dub them out, you get the issue that's happening with the Avengers and X-Men, <laughs> which I'm not even going to go into that because when X-Men comes up, I know it's going to be epic. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to go any further. This is my spoiler filled review of The Amazing Spider-Man. I've talked about a lot of different things. Um, I'm going to get ready to talk about um, the new shows that are coming out. But anyway, this is SEL0320. If you have any other thoughts about the Maze Spider Man, any other topics y'all want me to talk about, then I can definitely go into it. Like, I've, been, I've even went through with one of my friends and dissected the whole movie up and down, the pros and cons. I didn't bring up in the pros and the cons of this, I just talked about the different things I couldn't talk about in the last one, such as Gwen's death, such as uh, Electro supposed death, but I don't think so, such as the post credit stuff. Uh, such as at the end with Harry making out alive and then now supposedly he's got his face and everything back to normal or supposedly it comes and it goes like those things I could talk about in the first review because it was spoil everybody so this is a spoiler filled review <laughs> anyway this is SEL0220 I'm signing out y'all have a good one later